Hallelujah. So look, let's go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. I have used this scripture recently in one of my messages. And like I said, <laughs> uh, I was actually studying in Genesis. Man, I had the best time yesterday. I was off. Lord Jesus, make a move. And, and I was off. And look, I stayed in the bed from 7.30 till 3.30 studying the scriptures. Oh, it was a beautiful day for me, man. I was loving it. I was like, man, I don't need to do nothing else. Anyway, praise God. I enjoyed my day yesterday. Uh, I love the word of God. Amen. And so I started off in Genesis 13, and at some point in time, I ended up writing two messages yesterday, and I guess I'll end up preaching the other one at some point. That was the one that was connected to Melchizedek that we talked about Wednesday. But then this one here took on flavor all its own, and it will have some information out of Genesis. But I want to just share this scripture with you real quick. It says in Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10, it says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive. Let me go ahead and read it off of this version here. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And went out not knowing where he went. Next verse. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, that's another word for tent, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Amen. You know, so what this passage of scripture is, is telling us is this, is that Abraham, who is the father of the faith. Now, I don't know if, you know, what, if you really, what you, where you are in your understanding of the Bible, but the apostle Paul teaches us that Abraham is the father of the faith because, you see, God called him out at a time whenever you didn't, you couldn't see what God was really doing on the earth completely, amen? And so God called him out and he gave him a promise, but Abraham didn't even understand what that promise was really going to look like. And part of the promise was that God was going to give him a land that he could dwell in so that ultimately we know a nation came and through that nation the Lord gave, Father gave us Jesus for the redemption of our sins. Amen? And, and so from that time what we see here though is that while Abraham was called to receive an inheritance, the people on earth are also being called by the voice of God. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about voices. That's not the title of my message. I think if I was going to give my message a title, I think we already did, maybe. I think I, I entitled this morning's message, The Mind of Cain. Now, let me explain that a little bit because, see, what we see here is, is a believer on a journey. And he didn't really know exactly where God was bringing him, but he had heard the voice of God. And he knew that God was a builder of a city. And he was seeking after and searching after to find the city of God that God is the builder and the maker of. See, God is the, God is the carpenter of this city. Hallelujah. It's a celestial city. It's an eternal city. It's not temporary like the city that you've been living in as you navigate your journey in life. And it's important that you understand this. Because there's a spirit that's trying to get people to go towards the other city. And the spirit of God and the voice of God is calling people to move towards the city whose builder and foundation is God. And throughout the scriptures, if you will notice, if you're looking for it, you will begin to see that these two cities exist, that these two voices exist, and that people are following one or the other. Now, I've got to tell you that for quite some time, many, many years, I've been noticing various things within the scriptures. And, and for quite some time, I've noticed that Cain, and let me just say this, Cain, who was the firstborn of Adam and Eve, built, ended up building his own society. You understand that? Cain built a society that was separate from God's will. And that society has continued to be built to the modern days that we live in today. That same spirit that was behind what Cain did, and I can talk to you about some of these things in the Word of God, and to some extent, I hope that you will believe and accept and receive some of the things that I'm going to speak today. Some of the things that I'm going to speak today, I'm going to be honest with you, I never would have thought they'd come out of my mouth, but guess what? It's time that we speak the truth. The truth needs to be spoken. 
Okay, and we need to be able to recognize the timing that we're living in. We need to be able to recognize the things that are going on on the earth. And we need to be able to recognize that if you and I are truly in Christ, if you and I have truly given our heart and our lives to the Lord, if you and I have truly bought into the fact that Jesus purchased us with his blood, you may not believe that. You might be here for another reason today. And I'm just glad you're here. But I've got to be honest with you. I'm not here to tiptoe through the tulips today. I'm here to speak the truth. And if you are indeed one of us, and us is a people, a people of God, a people called by him, a people that have heard the calling like our father Abraham heard the call, and a people that desire to follow the pathway that leads to the city that God is the builder and the maker of. And along the way, there's many other voices. And the voices are vying for our attention. And I'm here to tell you, social media, whether you like it or not, it needs to go in the name of Jesus. Oh, I don't like it when you say that, preacher. Well, good. You just keep on scrolling through the lies and through the gossip and through the garbage that the enemy of this world is planting inside of your heart. And you watch and see how it begins to slowly pry you away from the word of God, from the truth of God's word, and whisper in your ear the lies of Cain, the mindset of Cain, and wanting to pull you away from the very God that loved you enough that he would send his only begotten son to die for you on Calvary's tree. Yes. But you go on. You go on. Feed it. Feed your spirit of man what you choose to feed your spirit of man. Lord, help us. Lord, give us revelation. Give us understanding. Let not the mind and the voice of Cain enter in and pull us away. And so here the people are. They're on a journey through the ages. And i got to tell you that I've been noticing this society built by Cain. And look, that was pre-flood. After the flood, guess what? Then I just took right up. He said, let us make bricks. Let us build ourselves a city. Let us make our ties. It's, it's a society that is being built. And I'm not even going to try to get into the occultic connection and how the occult world says that we, the Masons, bricklayers, say we were the true Babel was our endeavor. It's the same spirit that's behind it. you got to understand. It's like, well, Masonry didn't come to the same. No, it's the same spirit. Right. It's the spirit of Antichrist. It's the spirit of Jezebel. It's the spirit that is against God and is building its own society. And it's man helping man. Oh, we must care for our global brethren. You're a hater if you won't accept Islam. You're a hater if you won't accept the Buddha. You're a hater if you won't accept the things that we're telling you society is supposed to embrace. No, it's lies. The voice of a liar, church. And it's, listen, the world is being prepared for something that's coming. And if you can't read it, brother, then it's a good thing you showed up today because you will not walk out of this place without being made away. That's right. That there's a lying voice out there that's trying to lead you to another city. Amen. And if you end up in that city, you will be sorry. Amen. You will be sorry if that ends up being your final destination. And listen to me close. You can reject my words all you want to. And it won't harm you in the least little bit, my friend. But if you reject the word of the Lord, it will cause detriment to your soul. It will cause detriment to your walk. It will cause detriment to your life. And you just think things are bad now, buddy. But I guarantee you one thing. You keep rejecting the voice of God. And you will see a spiraling down. And listen, this is a word for the preacher. you got to start with me first. Because if you think I ain't never rejected some of the words of the Lord that he was speaking to me after I was a even after I was a preacher, then you got another thing coming. Lord, help us yes. not to reject the word of the Lord. Now I gotta tell you real quick, because I believe the Bible says give honor where honor is due. I was already on this trail of this society of Cain many, many years ago, but I did somebody sent me some videos. And I watched some videos, and I thought, wow, this was really good. I, could, I thought about posting it on our church website, but the guy was a Seventh-day Adventist, and I don't agree with a lot of their teaching, but I have to give honor where honor is due. This guy, he, he's a, he, he taught about this, and it was 
it was right on from the scriptures. I mean, it was good. And uh, look, and, and listen, the fruit of his life, he was a zoology professor out of South Africa. He's like, his voice and everything, it just like worked real well in his, the way he presented it. And he, he lost his job. He was a, uh, he was a tenured professor and he lost his job because he, he taught zoology, which is like biology of animal species. And they told him that he had to start being willing to teach evolution. He said that won't happen, and so he lost his position. But anyway, uh, his name is Walter Veith, V-E-I-T-H, if you want to. And he called it, the name of his message was called the Herodian mind. And he was talking about, he was talking about Herod. And he said he felt like Herod embodied what he was trying to speak, King Herod, what he was trying to describe, which was the society that was against God. He said, I could have called it the mind of Cain. I could have called it the mind of Nebuchadnezzar before Nebuchadnezzar bowed his knee. I could have called it the mind of another a Persian king. I could have called it the, not, the mind of Alexander the Great. I could have called it the mind of Antiochus Epiphanes. I could have called it the mind of another Roman emperor. Because the point is, is that this society has been coexisting with the society of God throughout the ages. So do you get the point? I hope you do. Abraham wasn't looking for that society. Abraham was called out of that society. Abraham was living in the midst of that society when he was living in his father's house. And God called Abraham and said, come out of your father's house and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. And through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. And the seed was, ends up being the nation of Israel. And the seed specifically is Jesus because the apostle Paul told us that that seed is Christ. All right. And so that's where we come in this story. Now, let's go ahead and let's turn to uh, Genesis chapter 13, and you may not understand how I twisted off on this, but I hope that when it's all said and done, you'll understand where we're going with this. And it says in, eight, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 13, verses uh, 3 through 4. Genesis 13, 3 and 4, and it says, And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, Unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Man, it's a beautiful thing when people begin to call upon the name of the Lord. The word of God talks about, even in Genesis 4, that whenever Enosh was born unto Seth, that then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Look, he journeyed from the Negev and he went as far as to Bethel and he made a camp. He made a camp in a specific place. These verses proclaim some, some powerful spiritual truths that every believer, and listen, I'm going to tell you something. I feel like I'm going to end up reading a little bit more of my notes today because I feel like the Lord led me in what to write. Now, look, I've been around a lot of preachers and a lot of people in the past and don't be trying to monkey around with me. Oh, man, preachers that read notes, they're not led by the Spirit of the Lord. How do you think you got the Word of God? Because the Lord spoke to people and they wrote it down on pieces of paper. Okay, so guess what? The Lord speaks sometimes whenever people write, and the Lord speaks sometimes and puts you on the fly to say whatever he puts in your heart at that moment. And a lot of that stuff goes on. So I'm just letting you know that I'm going to probably read a little bit more because I want to make sure that we get the point across the way I feel like the Lord God gave it to me. Amen? So these verses proclaim that every believer will find a place and he will have to make a decision when he gets to that place. And, and he will choose the direction in which he, he, he's going to travel. The right decision for the follower of God will always begin at the altar. Amen? For it is the altar of God that self dies so that God's will can come to life. And this is where the scripture says that Abraham made a camp between Ai and Bethel. There he built an altar and he got along with the Lord and he called on the name of God. Amen? And the altar is a beautiful place and even the altar in the church is a place where we lay self down. And listen, and throughout the Old Testament, the altar is a place of worship. You'll hear the Old Testament saints and they're like, the worship of God was to offer up a sacrifice on the altar because guess what? Jesus worshiped the Father whenever he gave his whole life. Worship is a sacrificial offering for those that are going to follow God. It's not just a music service. Yes, when you're coming to a music service, 
and they're leading us in worship, the idea is not entertainment, saints. The idea is, is that they're leading us to exalt Jesus. That he is the glorious one. He is the beautiful one. Look, we got if you gotta if we gotta turn all of the equipment off and sing our cappella so we can get the point. Jesus is the one that's to be exalted. Hallelujah. And that's what we do. And so when we come together and we lift our hands to heaven and we call upon the Lord, what we're doing is we're sacrificing. We're sacrificing unto the Lord. We're letting him, we're letting him receive the glory and the honor. We're we're, we're not exalting our problems, church. We're exalting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes. Amen. Because look, I've already said it. I said it last week that in this world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, for He has overcome the world. And so we come into the house of God to acknowledge that, to acknowledge that the God that we serve is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He ever maketh intercession for us. And you can live your life any way you choose. And if you choose to live your life without this Jesus that I preach, that's on you. Even my own family, if some of my own family choose, Lord, help. I don't want my heart to get hard, though. I can tell you that. The Lord's already shown me, don't let your heart get hard, boy. Because if you ain't praying for him, who's going to pray for him? That's right? right. Help right. us, Lord. Yeah. There's been times in my life where I'm like, look, I've been taught you the truth, and you refuse the truth, and I look at you. No! That's the wrong heart. Wrong spirit. No! Lord, soften me, have compassion on me, and let me see, oh Lord God, and not just for my own children or my own family, but for you. For, and, and for you to feel that way towards me, that our hearts will be soft and compassionate. Amen? But I want you to, I want to explain this a little bit more thoroughly. Look, Abraham is camped between a place called Bethel and Ai. The name of Bethel meaning house of God, and the name of Ai meaning a heap of ruins. He's camped between the house of God and a heap of ruins. And there he built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. What I need you to understand is that this is the place. This is the decision each and every day that you and I are making. We're either going to make our camp at the heap of ruins or we're going to make our camp at the house of the Lord. The people of God camp towards Bethel, the house of the Lord, where the presence of the God would be. Where we would, and listen, I'm not just talking about coming to church in the building. I'm talking about you are the church. You understand? Right. You are the church. You carry the presence of the living God on the inside of you if you are a true believer this morning. Mm -hmm. If you're not a true believer, you can't be. You don't even need me for that. You just need to bow your knee to Jesus, and you need to thank him for what he's done. Listen to me. Whether you agree with me or not, he deserves glory. He deserves thanks. Hallelujah. He deserves to be thanked for shedding his blood and paying the penalty for our sin. And that's all you got to do, my friend. Whether you're watching on video, whether you be in the house this morning, you just got to bow your knee to Jesus and thank him for dying for you and tell him, I believe it. I believe it, Lord, and I'm coming right. to my heart and transform my life. Amen? So, so this is the place. Faith for the New Testament believer begins and continues at the foot of the cross. It is faith in the finished work of our Lord's cross that allows the Spirit of God to make our heart His home. Without redemption, without forgiveness, there is no Holy Ghost living on the inside of your heart because you're still full of sin and the penalty for your sin has not been paid. You still walk around on this earth with the guilt and the debt of sin if you have not received the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for your sin payment and if you do not continue to keep your faith squarely in the finished work of Christ even to walk. See, because you got to understand something. Righteousness is not your righteousness. That's right. God won't accept your righteousness. That's right. right. God only accepts one kind of righteousness. Oh, but I've never killed anybody. I've never committed adultery. I've never told a lie. Lie. <laughs> I've never stole even a piece of bubble gum from the... Okay, look. All I'm trying to tell you is this. Your righteousness, the word of God says, is like filthy rags. Right. Yes. And that is talking about a menstrual rag. Right? That's what that's talking about. Not a menstrual like a saver. I'm talking about a mid-seas, like the time of the month kind of thing. That's how, that, that's how the Lord sees our righteousness is. When we try to take our own righteousness and exalt it. See, that's the mind of Cain. See, Cain wanted to worship the Lord. Cain had his own religion. It wasn't like he was like, come. He wanted to worship God the way he wanted to worship God. And the world says we want to worship God the way we want to worship God. And don't get in the way of what we say because we got the mind of Cain. And we have authority on this earth. And we want to worship God any way we want to. And if you get in the way, oh, 
then you got a price to pay. That's right. You got a price to pay. So in the light with the true believer, the Spirit of God lead us down the path of life. Where the flesh or my own will was crucified in the spirit, God's will remains resurrected and manifested in my life. Faith at the foot of the cross serves to keep Matt dead, the flesh of Matt dead. You see, I understand what I'm saying. Look, I've talked about this many times. People don't understand. I don't understand when you talk about the message of the cross. Listen to me. You need to understand something. There's two sides to Calvary, my friend. There's one <laughs> where the old man that's born in Adam, broken and all crooked, dies at the foot of the cross. Come on, somebody. And then there's another side of Calvary where the old man becomes a new man because he's resurrected Hallelujah. inside and he's now in Christ. Hallelujah. He's in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is where you live. There's a death side of Calvary where the old man dies, and there's a resurrection side of Calvary where the new man comes to life because the Spirit of God now lives on the inside of him, and if you will see him, he will come to life, and he will flourish, and you will begin to see the victory of God taking place in your life. Amen. But you go on and keep feeding the new man the old man's diet and see what happens. Don't challenge me in that, please. I know I sounded like a challenge, but don't challenge me in that. It's not a good challenge. In Genesis 13, verse 7, it says that as they're on their journey, it says right here, there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwell then in the land. This verse tells us that there was strife, and the idea is a quarrel, that took place between Abraham and Lot, and this strife is about the result of some decisions. And if, if the Lord says the same, we'll probably, we're going to get into that a little bit more next week, okay? Or the next time I'll preach. This verse tells us there was strife or a quarrel between Abraham and Lot, and the strife is about the result in decisions that are going to open spiritual doors. You need to understand that, Christian. You need to understand that the choices that you and I make, the decisions that we make, open spiritual doors in our life. If they're good spiritual decisions, it's going to open the door to the Spirit of God blessing us, strengthening us, encouraging us, giving us victory, healing us. But if we keep on opening doors of the flesh, to, to, to God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. If a man sows to his flesh, of the flesh, he will also eat. And when we open these doors, demonic entities have access. I don't care how much you love Jesus. That's right. Now, you don't understand. If the Lord started to change my way of thinking. Do I believe in the exorcist possession? Oh, listen. You think for one second that when you open the door to the devil and you walk it over there to the door of, and you're like, oh, well, a little bit of gossip never hurt nobody. Come on in. You think that the Lord behind gossip, my friend? No. The Lord put gossip in the same verse as he put murderers and other types of sin. No, we just don't think that it's that bad. I'm picking gossip because every last believer up in this house has gossiped at one time or another in their life. Because we don't want we don't want to pick on homosexuality because some of you are like, well, I never had no problem with homosexuality. So you're gonna think you're okay. No, 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 no. We're gonna hit it where it hurts. Because we don't understand something. And listen, you open up that window, you open up that window of gossip, and you won't even know it. You be plagued. You invited that thing. You be plagued, That's right. and you find. Listen. You know how I know it's a spiritual attack because I used to be under the bondage of the spirit of gossip before the Lord got a hold of me. And listen, I didn't even know I was under the bondage of the spirit of gossip until the Lord set me free from the bondage of the spirit of gossip. Then I was able to look back, and I was like, Oh my God, dude! I enjoyed that so much. That's weird. It. I, it was scintillating. Like, oh, my flesh remembers, liked it. 
I took joy in her rebel and being able to speak even under the cloak of prayer. Come oh, on. let's pray for the brethren. Let's pray, but we ain't no praying no more. Come on. We're just over there talking about the Lord. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about it and saying, oh, look. And you know why I feel like it? You know why it's scintillating to our flesh? Because the more we focus on the faults of other people, we feel better about ourselves. ourselves. Yeah. Oh, look at that poor soul right there. And in reality, the Lord's trying to talk to us. He's trying to get our head right. All right, you understand what I'm saying? But look, when you open up doors, you see, when you open up doors, you let spiritual things in. Look, there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham's livestock, and decisions are about to be made. Listen, why? I'm not even getting into Lot this morning, but Lot's about to make some decisions that are going to open up some spiritual door that's going to last for a long time and cause a lot of trouble. It's going to cause trouble for his family. It's going to cause trouble for his own people. It's going to cause a lot of trouble. His wife will get lost in the midst of it all. That's right. Decisions that open spiritual doors and they result in major failures, but hallelujah at the same time, every time there's a failure, it's an opportunity for God to show up in a victory. Amen. Do you believe that this morning? I hope you believe that this morning. Because you need to understand that like even I might be speaking to you right now, and I hope that the Lord would say so. I think I might be being plagued by a spirit of gossip. Oh, no, you don't know it. If I'm speaking to you, the Lord's ministering to your heart. Because guess what? Don't think you can be sitting up in this church for the last however many years we've been open and not think that a spirit of gossip has possibly not jumped on you and plagued you. A spirit of religion, a critical spirit, a spirit of self-righteousness. Do you think that that's just something in your flesh? No! The enemy is trying to attach himself to your mind and to your soul and he's trying to prevent you from being able to have the compassion and the love of the Christ and the love of the Holy Spirit that says in the book of Acts they were of one mind, one accord. They were in unison, in unity. And listen, and we can't even get there in our own heart how we're going to get there as a church. Okay. Oh, the Lord's coming against it. Right. The Lord's coming against it. Don't be opening up the doors, child of God. Right. Don't be opening up the doors. And y'all know how it starts. I was talking about, to, about that to Aaron. I think just it was yesterday, you know. Like, oh, man, did you hear about such and such? And then they kind of just leave it like that. You know, I'm going to be like, you know what? <laughs> no, I didn't. And don't want to. Hello? Come on. Don't want to, because I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Do they need prayer? That's why I'm telling you where I want. Because see, there's even still a part in me. Sometimes that if you throw that little lure out there, I might be like, let me nibble on there a little bit. I don't want to nibble on that no more. So like, just do me a favor. If I talk to you, don't, don't be throwing no nibbles to me. Cause, and I don't mean that ugly. And I, I don't mean that against anybody in particular. Like if somebody said, if you, you know, look, they need prayer. Okay, tell me that. And I'll pray for them. And, and look, if I try to ask them, what if they, oh, pastor, come on, holy brother. And say, if you didn't want to know, and then I'll to receive my correct. Amen? Because I want to try to train my brain mm -hmm. to, to think in the terms of praying for the brothers and sisters, not in talking about the brothers and sisters. Amen? I hope that helps. I hope that that rings true to your heart. Amen? You will find yourself, listen, I said, listen, child of God, do not play with spiritual truth. You will find yourself on the wrong end of results if you do not heed the word of correction from the Lord. Amen. And it also says that the Perizzite and the Canaanite lived in the land. If truth be told in a sense, this already belongs to Abraham. You know what I'm talking about? The land belongs to Abraham. What are you talking about, preacher? God promised him the land. He just hasn't received it yet because, look, this land has not been dispossessed of the Canaanite yet because the victories of Joshua have not taken place yet. God has given you and I victory in Christ, but then, and listen, one day the Word of God says we will rule and reign with Him, but the millennial reign of Christ has not shown up yet. But at the same time, God has given us authority as kings and priests upon this earth, and I believe this, that everywhere our foot treads, God wants to give you and I victory in the spiritual realm because he wants you and I to be able to bring victory into the lives of other people. Does that mean that we're never going to face hostility? Come on, man. Well, you know that that's not true. People dying all over the earth today for the cause of Christ. The blood of the martyrs have been, has been spilled upon this fallen earth for thousands of years of human history. So that's not true. Therefore, 
therefore, in that sense, they live, they live, Abraham and Lot, in a spiritual climate that all God's people are living in, at least until the consummation of the ages. Let me build on this. Since the fall and even before the flood, we see this scenario play out on earth. What I mean is that when man sinned in Adam, a spiritual shift resulted. You've got to understand these things. Whether we like it or not, Adam's fall resulted in a change in dominion. Whereas God had created the earth for Adam, which is humanity, and Adam was given dominion and authority over the creation to rule, the fall gave power to the forces of evil. And if you can't see that, then your eyes are closed and you're asleep. But good news. God has been offering redemption. Through, from that time, God has offered redemption through the promise of the Lamb. God is king, the earth is his, and he has been, since the fall, taking it back. We just have to slow down and watch what is really going on. Amen. Adam's choice has resulted in the fact that God's creation now has a sinful nature. Their sinful nature drives them to choose a life away from God. God's voice of truth calls them home, but it is inevitable that countless will ignore the call and choose instead the other path. I know that sounds like a negative confession. No, it's reality. There will be billions of people. Listen, I'm trying to tell you the truth. The Bible says, wide is the way to destruction. The, the, the road is wide, the gate is wide that leads to destruction. And many there will be that find themselves on that path. And narrow is the way. And narrow is the gate that leads unto life. And there will be few that find that way. It doesn't sound like a good message, but it's the truth. That there will be billions of people that have refused the call, have refused the pathway that led to the city, that the builder and maker is God. But Abraham is a type of the one who went before us, and we should learn to follow his lead. Let's talk about the other path a little bit. Let's talk about the land of the Canaanite and the parasite. Whether we realize it or like it, this has resulted in both the kingdom of God, I'm talking about the fall of man, both the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness are coexisting on the earth today. Good news is that if you were in the kingdom of darkness, you could be translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Through faith in Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Faith in him, we become born again. We get a new start. Amen. Amen. It's like, reboot the computer, defibrillate the heart that's quivering, bring life out of death, resurrection power through the finished work of the cross. You got to go, and if you're going to live, you got to die, and if you'll die in Christ, you'll get new life. That's the gospel. Whether we realize it or like it, the two kingdoms are coexisting. God's sacrifice that covered Adam and Eve's spiritual neck and has paved the way for Abel to offer a blood sacrifice. Come on now. Chew on that a little bit. You think that that was an accident whenever Adam and Eve showed up in the garden and trying to clothe their own nakedness with fig leaves? Oh, Eve, you're such a, you're such a wonderful seamstress. Look at this. We have material. We have, we have wisdom. We have Skills. Let us create for ourselves our own clothing to hide our nakedness from the Lord. God says that's not going to work. It's going to require the shedding of blood. It's going to require the shedding of blood. It's going to require a sacrifice from an innocent one. See, that animal ain't had nothing to do with Adam and Eve's disobedience. That poor little animal, Adam had named him. He didn't have nothing to do with that mess. But the Lord had to, out of his justice. Because the wages of sin is death. God had to allow death to occur to bring redemption to, to replace death and life. God's sacrifice that covered Adam and Eve's spiritual nakedness paved the way for young Abel, their second offspring, to offer a blood sacrifice. Y'all remember the story? Abel offered a blood sacrifice. Cain offered the fruit of the ground. He offered the works of his own hands. But look, what happened was this. Cain hated his brother's sacrifice. Why? Because God rejected Cain's sacrifice and accepted Abel's sacrifice. And God, out of his mercy, does God speak to your heart when you go the wrong way? Yes, he will. Are you listening? 
Yeah. So Cain goes the wrong way. What does God do? God tries to correct him. Why are you downcast, Cain? You ever see somebody walk in the house of the Lord, their face is all long, all sad looking? Come on. Why are you downcast, Cain? If you do what is right, you will be made okay. What is right? Sin is crouching at the door, desires to have you, but you must master it. How will I master sin, O oh Lord? Through the sacrifice, through a blood sacrifice, through an innocent blood sacrifice that will pay the penalty for your sin, or at least cover it until he comes. Cain hated his brother. He rejected it. And look, Cain killed his brother, but he rejected the voice of God. He went further. Listen, we cannot expect that if the Lord speaks to our heart and gives us truth and we continue to, to reject his truth, we cannot expect that we will not spiral down further. Cain rejected the voice of the Lord, and since that day, he killed his own brother. And since that day, the righteous blood of Abel has been, or the righteous blood of the saints have been poured out upon this fallen earth. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Have you done a study on church history? Have you done a study even in the book of Hebrews when it talks about the cloud of witnesses and the prophets before that were saw the son and the lost their life? Have you, do I need to remind you again that, that the apostle Paul had his head cut off under the Nero Roman Empire? Have, do I need to remind you that Peter was crucified upside down? Do I need to remind you that Mark, the author of the gospel, was dragged through the streets of Egypt behind a chariot? Do I need to remind you that Th Thomas, who, who was named as the doubter, was also run through with a Brahmin Indian sword on the soil of India as he was preaching Jesus because he wasn't down no more suffering? Do I need to remind you about all the martyr's blood that has been spilled upon this earth. I shouldn't have to remind you, but look, we're spoiled. Yes. We're spoiled in America. Yes, we We've been blessed to be born. And I don't even remember to say, Lord, forgive me, in the home of the brave, in the land of the free. We've been blessed to be born in this country. The laws have been on our side. Why? So that you can have what you want? And you might have thought that. No! So the gospel of Jesus Christ could go forth in these last days. And we have lived under this umbrella of safety that was given to us by God. And we're spoiled because of it. Help us, Lord. And we think we have it bad. That's what they're telling us on, so on the media. That we got it bad. And yet, and yet, at the same time, as bad as we got it, they're trying to come across the border in droves. Yeah. And you talk to them. Because, look, I done got over that stuff, dude. Yeah. I done got over my little bad attitude about all that. I know why them people trying to get over here because I haven't been to their country. Yeah. And guess what? I ain't changing it. This, there's some wickedness going on on this earth. And you can build a wall, and I'm a, I don't have a problem with a wall. <laughs> but if we think that this is going to fix the spiritual climate, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to tell you it's not. That's right. And those people, you know why they're coming over here? I'm telling you why they're coming over here because they're hungry for change. Mm -hmm. They're hungry for hope. Mm -hmm. You see, and we over here sitting back fat and sassy. <laughs> and we can't even strip the shingles off our roof no more because our bellies are so big that we can't even get up on the roof. <laughs> right? But they'll, they'll strip a roof. They'll strip a roof and re shingle it so fast and make an American head spin. <laughs> That's right. You'd be like, wait, what? That's right, that's right. Hold the brain. Land in the free. Give me a chance, boss. Heck that. Come on. Give me some work and let me get it done. Put some money in my pocket. I'm here to the, I'm here to make. And, that, and that's the idea. And we sit back like a bunch of fat cats laying up in our lazy butt bed. Lord forgive me for saying so. <laughs> and, and we don't want to get nothing done. But anyway, that's another story for another time, right? Because the Lord said that when you work, to work as unto the Lord. That's right. Because, see, your work ethic is a reflection of your relationship with your Jesus. Right. Exactly. All right. In other words, Jesus didn't quit halfway up the hill, my friend. Yeah. Thank God he did. <laughs> Hallelujah, boy. You ever thought about that before, what a mess this place would be had Jesus not gone through with it? Oh, no. Dude, that's ugly. Don't even go there. Don't let you put it on. Cain's murder was the result of his rejection to God's word. A rejection to God's word results in death to the spiritual man and gives power to the carnal man. It may be hard for us to understand this, but God is allowing evil to rule governments. That was what, one of the major revelations that I got through this Walter Veith video. I already knew it. 
But it became even much more clear that God is allowing the evil to rule over the evil. We like to believe that our nation is godly and righteous, but this government is filled with wickedness, sorcery, and all manner of evil. And listen, it's on both sides of the aisle, my friend. I know I keep saying it. I am a conservative at heart. I believe in less taxes and let the people work hard. And I believe in trickle-down economics. I believe in free enterprise. I believe in freedom and liberty. But if you believe that just because you vote for an R in front of the name, that you vote for, that that stands for righteousness, wrong. That's right. You go ahead and you Google Bohemian Grove. You go ahead and hold that in your head. You, when you go home, Bohemian Grove. You go home and you Google Bohemian Grove and you see who the presidents are that are sitting at that table inside the wickedness of that woods where they do every year sorcery and the billionaires and the earth go over there to that place in that redwood forest and get naked and frolic around and worship pagan gods. You go ahead and you see who the presidents are on that page and you'll see that it wasn't no Democrat. And you do what you want with that. You do your own research and you find out. I'm trying to tell you that this is a puppet show. I've been trying to tell you this. Nobody wants to listen to me. And they keep filling themselves with Fox News. And they keep filling themselves with Newsmax. And I don't know, maybe Newsmax is better. I ain't buying it completely. I ain't buying none of their stories. I know this. I know one story. And this is it right here. Boom. This is it right here. This is the truth. This is the truth of God's word. I'm going to live my life by this. I'm going to live my life by the grace of God, by the Spirit. Of what this says, the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of the bride says, Come, let he who is thirsty come, let him come and drink of the waters of life freely. That's the voice that's calling us home right there. And any voice that gets in the way of that is a voice of a lie. Help us. God is allowing governments to exist on the earth. We like to believe again that we're just we're we're, we're in the clear, we're a righteous nation. Okay, God is allowing it to continue until the consummation of the ages when he will destroy the rebellion of the nations and make those nations the footstool of our Lord. There's coming a day when every nation yes. will bow. Yes. In the meanwhile, we get a glimpse of what this looks like when we see what God says to Cain. Look at Genesis chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. Genesis 4, 15 through 17, God speaks to Cain. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, who so, because look, Cain's freaking out now, right? Because, because God said, because of your what you've done, you're gonna be you're gonna be banished from the presence of the Lord. Now, now I don't know what would have happened had Cain like fallen on his knees and said, Father, I don't I don't know what I did, I don't know what I was thinking, instead of please forgive me. Please forgive me. I don't see where he does that. It says that the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever can, he's worried, I'm going to die. How will I live? He says, Whoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Next verse. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Next verse. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch, and he built a city, and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, I want to make a couple of points right here. Number one, people are like, well, okay, where Cain found that woman? But it was his sister, dude. Come on. Let's just call it what it is. There was two people that started off on earth. There wasn't no other people on earth. But at that time, God allowed it. For people to remultiply like that, and then when the Levitical law came, he said, No more, shut it down. And God is God, He is sovereign, and that's how it happened. Ain't no other way for it to happen. Because if it happened another way, then it was some alien race, or it was some other offspring that we're not told about that did possibly have a sinful nature. And that ain't the, the word of the Lord. So that's what it was. They lived hundreds and hundreds of years. Get over your you get over your little bump in the road and just keep on moving forward because God is sovereign. <laughs> Hallelujah! You're sovereign, Lord. You got time. Amen. 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 All right. So let's we got that on. <laughs> now I want you to I want you to see that. We need to understand something. Cain has been driven from the presence of God because of his disobedience against God's word. Cain is afraid of his demise. 
And God protects him with a mark that signifies vengeance against unruly or unfettered murder upon the earth. In other words, Cain brought murder into the world, but now he fears that he will be murdered. So God provides a form of protection against this so that society can, t can continue until the day that God says it's the end. From there, Cain produced his offspring and built a city. I want you to understand, he builds a city. Can you put that back up there, Sandy, real quick? He builds a city, and look, I said a society. Because listen, remember, this is pre-flood. I told you Nimrod said, let us build the cell of the city. This thing's still been going on. A city is being built. It's a new city. It's the Tower of Babel. It's a new city. It's a new world. It's a reset. A reset's coming. Y'all get, listen, I don't mean to, to act weird and throw something out there. I tried to play around with the stock market. So far, I'm still kind of down or whatever. But look, I started getting these little investors' email updates. And you may already be aware of this. I don't know, but just in case you're not, let me just throw this out there. I got an email the other day, and I'm like, hmm, this is kind of interesting. This guy, he's, now he claims he got his law degree from Georgetown. That's another story. He's been an investment banker. He worked for the CIA. All these kinds of stuff. And he said, listen, it's coming. It's right around the corner. He calls it Biden Bucks. But it's a digital dollar. And listen, since then, three other sources, this ain't some conspiracy theory, dude. This dude, he ain't no believer. He's just telling you what he sees happening. A digital dollar, or not crypto. See, the, a digital dollar that the Federal Reserve Bank has control of. Okay, that's the difference. With crypto, the little bit I understand, the Federal Reserve Bank has no control over that. Y'all understand who the Federal right. Reserve Bank is? Yep. It's the Illuminati. It's the Rothschild thing. It's yep. the Kennedys. It is what it is. Yep. I used yep. to be scared they were going to kill me. Little video on me. <laughs> in South Louisiana, if I started telling the truth. I ain't really that scared anymore. I don't even know that they, they don't even know I exist. And if they do, oh well. Much more in the blood. Because you know what I'm saying, now I'm not need the grace of God to have to face it. But the point is this the truth must be spoken. Amen. The Come truth on. must be spoken. And so what he's trying to say is no, it's not right around the corner. It's a digital dollar that they can turn it off if you don't do what they tell you. See, it's one thing if you want to shot it, but if you don't want to shot, shouldn't you be able to say no to a shot? Right. See, it's one thing if you want a, an electric vehicle, <laughs> but what if you want a gas burner? Right. What if you want a diesel? Okay. Oh, you're not going to buy? I'm just trying to say, I'm trying to create a scenario. You refuse to buy the EV, boom, we turn the dollar off. Could this even happen before the mark of the beast? Oh, look, I'm just trying to say, look, you want to talk about some, you want to talk about some stuff, all right? You can call it crazy if you want to. Could this happen even before the mark of the beast when they start turning the dollar off before you even happen to, oh, that's not weighing you down, buddy. You thought your little American life was good. Oh, yeah, baby, I got superfluous blessing. I'm driving down the road. I got blessing. Just flowing off of me, baby. It can just reach into other people. And so far, by the grace of God, I got a little bit of blessing that reaches into other people's lives. There might be a day where, look, look, Lord, send the raven. Like you said, Elijah by the brook, Jared. Send the raven. Send me some food. I don't even know how that raven got that food there. Let's not talk about that. We don't want to talk about bird. I'm bird. I'm going to feed the lady. But anyway, he said he brought the bread. But look, I just want to throw that out there. Because look, from that time, Cain produces offspring and he builds himself a city. Mm. Now, you see this, he named the city after his son Enoch. And I want you to know that that gentleman made a big point. I've seen this before in the scriptures, but just so you're not confused, this ain't the good Enoch. This is another Enoch. Huh? Hey, that's right. There are two lineages. Yeah. There's a line of Seth and there's a line of Cain. Yep. This is bad Enoch. Mm. This Enoch is actually before, because you've got to understand, this is Cain's offspring. And Seth has a son named Enoch, and Enoch walked with God, and God took him. Yes, this is a wicked Enoch. This is a wicked city. This is a society that is being built outside of God. <coughs> and this is a society that continues to exist before our very eyes today. That I have bad news to report to you. The American government is calling this society. Come on. They have just cloaked themselves in such a way that they hide it from us. And we can't see it. And we're caught up in the puppet show. Come on. Yeah. All this stuff going on. Yeah. And there's something up higher. And God's allowing it to happen. That's what you got to understand. Yeah. Daniel wrote in his book, what is written will come to pass. Yes. 
All the confession in the world ain't going to change it. Oh, it might delay the time. It might delay the time, but God, you are not going to use God against his own word. That's right. And if you try to, it'd be witchcraft. You're not supposed to twist God's word and turn it back on himself. Anyway, Lord God. This society has a stamp of approval by God. Look, it's on his head. God put the mark on him. God said, whoever kills Cain will be avenged sevenfold. God put the mark on him. God gave this world authority. And he says, he is at least allowing these two societies to coexist until his kingdom comes. In that, if you happen to watch that teaching of that God, he kept talking about it. How God is allowing the evil to rule over the evil. And he used this illustration of his wife being a school teacher. And he said she worked in an in a area that was very impoverished. And like the people were, like the kids were like literally, like it was bad. And she couldn't do her thing. The principal couldn't change it. She couldn't change it. You know, and, and because he was talking about the laws that man makes. And if you look through the history, see, we're, we're very sheltered. If we don't know where, we, where we've been in society, we just think that this is life. This is all there's ever been. No, this is very new. This little frontier, these little last couple, 300, however years we've been in existence in America is very, very new. This government situation is very, very different than what it's gone before. The Roman Empire, look, Herod heard that there was another king. What he did, he killed all the babies two years and under. That's right. yep. There's been kingdoms, the Assyrian Empire, where they like literally draw, <coughs> draw a quarter in the medieval times. Even like if you watch Braveheart, draw a quarter. What you talking about? Tying their legs to one set of horses and tying their arms to the other and slap that thing on the flank and watch the show. And the people would show up out there eating their apples with their two teeth. Watching. <laughs> and I mean, I didn't mean to make fun of that. You know, I'm just saying, they didn't have no dental hygiene back then. And they're over there trying to watch this show, and they're like, yeah, people's hearts are hard. People dying, limbs being pulled, blood scattered on the ground. This has been going on for years and years and years. And we're naive to what's happening. But yet God has allowed the stamp of Cain to be, to give him authority in, in, in governments to rule. And many times that's why the word of God says when the wicked rule, the people are down, right? But when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. That's right. With these thoughts in mind, I have little doubt that this is man building a society separate from God's plans. I have little doubt that this mark given to Cain is the beginnings of the kingdom of Antichrist that will end with a mark signifying his government authority. I never saw that before. I knew that was always something with that mark. I don't even know if that man actually said it. If he did, you can come back. If you watch the video, let me know. But I, I felt like God spoke that to my heart last night. That this, this mark given to Cain is the beginnings of the kingdom of Antichrist that will end with a mark signifying his government authority. Furthermore, I now understand that whether people realize it or not, they are choosing one kingdom or the other to live within. They may not even realize it. Though they're scrolling through their social media, they got aggravated when they heard me say that. They popped up. They got frustrated. They're like, you're talking about my kingdom, man. You're talking about my... Yeah, they ain't saying that, but that's what's... Something's not right. Why do I feel that? Why do I feel that disturbance? Because that demon spirit don't want you getting out of that, my friend. That demon spirit wants to hold you trapped. Like, look, if I was flexing one up, I'd wrap my legs up on the pole. That's what that demon spirit looks like. Man. He just whispered lullabies to your ear. He's whispering, don't let it go. Don't let it go. Come on, you know how good it feels when we gossip together. You know how good it feels when you look down on other people through your religious nose because you believe that you're so righteous. Come on. Don't let me go. Me and you've been walking together for a long time. Let me whisper these lullabies. Don't let me go. You know, you know how good you feel when you put that stuff on the inside of you. You know how good it feels when you hold that that you ain't supposed to hold. Don't let it go. No, it's a lie. Jesus, it's a on. lie. It's a lie. He's holding us in bondage whenever we get into that. When we open those doors, he's making us a prisoner. We can't even walk in freedom. 
We keep going back and seeing what the bomb is like a bomb that vomited. And we come back over there and we keep licking that garbage up. Lord, help us. Help us to turn away from the lies of Satan. Whether they realize it or not, they're choosing one kingdom or the other to live within. God tells us to respect the authority in Romans 16, does he not? He does. The authorities wield the sword, Romans 16 says. God allows the authorities to exist on earth and wield the sword, and sometimes the wickedness of kingdoms results in carnage and bloodshed, and sometimes God's people get caught up in the skirmish. What I meant to tell you is that he said that his wife was a teacher and that she couldn't control the classroom, the principal couldn't control the classroom, and she said this, because he's talking about the government of wicked people. And she said, okay, well, do y'all want to make your own rule? And they said, yes! And he did. she let them start making their own rules. And this is the kind of stuff he says, he claims, that they came up with. If you're caught chewing gum in the classroom, you will crawl on your knees, on the cement, from the classroom, all the way to the principal's office, and back again. And they lived by their rules. They loved being able to exert rules and regulations on top of the people. And, and she just said, roll yourself. If you don't want me to have leadership in this classroom, go on, make your rules and rule yourself. And she said, once I did that, it was like I was able to do my job to the least. <laughs> and that's really what's been going on in society. We're just, again, confused because we've been an American nation and we've seen these laws that have allowed the truth of the gospel. That's why we experience any freedom at all if we're experiencing freedom. Listen, I was thinking, talking to somebody the other day, and I was thinking about Lady Justice, right? Lady Justice. I don't know if that's an American thing or if it came from the British Empire. I don't know where it started, but you remember the story. Lady Justice got scales in her hands, and they're equal, and she got a blindfold on her eye. And you know what the proverb says? God hates uneven, uneven scales and un unequal balance. So Lady Justice is not the law. God's word is the law. Amen. Amen. And as soon as Lady Justice's scales start skewing off of the word of the Lord, she ain't got balanced scales no more. But that's the government that we live with. They proclaim Lady Justice, but they're making laws that are contrary to the law that you and I have decided to live our life, which is the word of God. God tells us to respect those authorities. They will the sword. Look, this is important. This part right here. When the laws of the land result in a believer having to transgress God's laws, the believer is now faced with a moral dilemma, and the result of the choices will either result in a spiritual blessing or a spiritual curse. There's, there may come a day, Christian, when the laws of the land begin to transgress the laws of God. Actually, they're already happening. They're already happening. In the New Testament, the believer has been given authority by God to walk in victory as his ambassador on this foreign soil. <laughs> Peter said that we are pilgrims. This temporary place is not our home. Jesus said that he has given us authority to trample on scorpions and serpents. That means that he has given us victory and authority over the works of Satan. Why? So that you and I can proclaim the message about the kingdom of God. He wants you and I as individuals, not just, not just my job. If you actually buy into the gospel message, he wants to use you as a vessel. You are a king and priest. He wants to use you as a mouthpiece. He wants to use you as a prophet. He wants you to speak the voice of truth to the people that you come into contact with. This don't go well down the road, I can assure you. Because everybody gets all skirmished. Oh, God never does. Oh, God's called you to be a witness, my friend. God has called you to allow God to change you, and then he wants to use you to speak that truth of change to someone else who needs that change. Now, listen, that doesn't mean that we're not going to maybe get hurt doing it. Y'all don't like that part. I don't like it either, but it's just reality. That doesn't mean... Then he gave us victory just to live the American dream, right? Three kids, a nice job, nice car, nice house. No, we have been blessed to be born and live in America where we have thus far 
benefited from the laws that God allowed for the furtherance of the gospel. But if we think that we may not lose those freedoms before the end, we're asleep spiritually. I started down this vein when I noted that the Perizzites and the Canaanites were in the land. It was their land. The reason why is because though Abraham had been promised the land, it was not given yet. And even though we have been promised the land, we will not completely rule and reign until Jesus comes back. Victories, yes. Proclaimers of truth, yes. Completely free from possible harm, no. That's not what the Bible says. The main point that I really want to make is that while they have the sword, which is government power, and as they inch closer to their fulfillment of the mark of the society that they are building, we are seeing more and more evidence of what is happening. Now you got to you got to bear with me whenever I speak because look, it's time that some that some truths be spoken. Look, their voice is changing society. The voice of Cain, the voice of the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the voice of Babylon. The voice of Persia, the voice of Greece, Rome, the voice of human government, even when cloaked in the U.S. flag, is speaking a different language than the word of our Lord. And the question is this, who will we listen to? Satan is mounting an attack on this world and he is using our nation as a nest to hatch his eggs. There is a mouth rising up and speaking blasphemous things. Daniel warned about the mouth of the little horn that would rise up and speak blasphemy and attempt to change times and laws. That spirit is here now. That voice is speaking and the world is listening and following the flute of the piper. His voice screams that homosexuality is normal. It screams that transgender is normal. It screams that divorce is okay. It screams that there are many ways to God. And there is a shift taking place in society. And social media is just pushing the agenda. There's a shift taking place. And part of the shift is that there is a degrading in God's government structure. And that the family unit is being destroyed. The result is that there are no more fathers. And when there are fathers, if the family structure is not recognized and respected by both parties, the power, listen to me, you may not like what I'm about to say, but it's time the truth be spoken. The power is given to the woman to exert authority over the man. I'm not scared of the spirit of feminism because it is not of God. I'm also not scared to say that men have treated women wrong throughout the ages of society. And because of that, there's an overcorrection. The, spirit of, the spirits of darkness love this stuff. Dude, they're back there cackling. They're just rubbing their own long demonic fingernails on the blackboard and they're cackling. Oh, strife, baby. Strife between Abraham. Strike between life. Strike between the world as they live and the world that we live in. This is our world. And we want to destroy the structure of God. Mm. Mm -hmm. All of the wrongs the male gender has caused has resulted in the loss of the man's spiritual authority that he was given by God. He is walking around spiritually defeated because he is outside his proper place in society. Because society has rejected God's structure of government, the power of a woman is rising up and dominating the man. The spirit of Jezebel. What are you trying to say, preacher? Are you trying to say women don't have a right? That's not what I'm trying to say. I've seen women that are better leaders than any man could ever be. So don't turn my words into something that I'm not saying. I've seen women that pay such close attention to detail and ain't scared to tell somebody how the cow eats the cabbage and that God gave them the will that they need in order to be a leader that's better than any man. Because most men don't even pay attention to detail. I'm not talking about all you guys. I'm just saying sometimes. So that's not what I'm trying to say. God has gifted people. I believe in women preachers. I got saved under the ministry of a woman preacher. Oh, hallelujah. We got an awesome woman preacher in our midst. I love women preachers. So then if you think I'm saying something like that, you miss the point. I'm talking about God placed a structure yes. 
And he wants the man to rise up and to walk in the authority, the spiritual authority that God has given to you. If he be listening to the voice of God, he's going to do the right thing. He ain't going to be like my dad. Oh, he lame. You know what time it is coming in from offshore. I got to put my white glove on. Run my little white finger up on that, that refrigerator. What is this, Elaine? Dude, what is that garbage, dude? You need to take that draconian stuff. You need to, Lord Jesus. That's a bunch of garbage right there. Right, right. That spirit needs to die in the name That's of right. Jesus. Yes. That is the Lord. Come on. Anyway. Shift taking place. All of the wrongs the male gender has caused have resulted in the loss of man's spiritual authority, and because society has rejected God's structure of government, the power of the woman is rising up and dominating the man. Men have greatly harmed and taken advantage of women. Now, in the government of Cain, a spiritual shift is taking place, and man is being expelled from his position of authority, and most of it is his own fault because he is transgressing God's word. Because let us be clear all a man has to do is be led by God. Follow the voice of God, live within the confines of God, and God will heal his land. But if he ventures out and builds his own society while the wicked hearts of men have been long in their domination over women, it is not right that the structure of God is being destroyed on the earth. Amen. It's not. God has placed a structure for our protection. When we rebel from that structure, the results are pain. Children being born into blended families creates heartache and pain and the pushing back and forth. The child bears the brunt of the heartache. We demand justice for what belongs to us, but in some ways we forget that we did it our way instead of his way, and now we hate the results. And it's in the church too. And what we just got to do is we just got to calm down, and we got to put our eyes on Jesus, and we got to keep hearing his voice, and we got to just follow his lead. Because listen, there are going to be repercussions in the decisions that we have made. But God will still work through them. Nay, he will work in them. He will use them for his benefit and his glory in your life. If you'll allow it. And that's the message of the gospel. There's a whole lot of stuff in the Bible that we don't like because our flesh doesn't like it. But it's a beautiful thing when we surrender to it. Because he does the work in our hearts and in our lives. Look, the American Academy of Pediatrics, you know how I knew this? Because I'm, I'm working pediatrics. And about eight years ago, I guess it was, because I got a lot, y'all can tell I got a big mouth. <laughs> when they made our new office, I don't know, it's been eight years, I don't even know how long I've been in that new office. But anyway, it was in the new office, because the doors are hollow, and you can hear through the walls. And I was in there talking to this mom, and I really don't even do this anymore because, look, you sit here and you talk about biblical things with people that may not be serving the Lord, and you never know what's going to end up happening. <laughs> but at that time, I was talking to this woman, and I was like, well, you know, and I was talking about saying, and I was talking about the proverb that said, if you spoil the rod, spare the rod, you spoil the child. I mean, I believe this thing. I obviously didn't do everything, right? <laughs> or either that people have a free will of their own. I, don't, I haven't figured all that out yet. I may not know it until the end, but. I can tell you this, pray. Don't, don't spare the rod. Don't stop instruction, but pray more than you do. Any other thing. Can I just tell you that on the other side? Please pray for your children. Don't let your heart get hard for your children. Pray more. Pray more than you're praying now. Please. Anyway, I'm over here telling this mom this, and all of a sudden I hear this other physician that I work with. Mr. Matt! The American Academy of Pediatrics just put out a new position paper, and they are not for corporal punishment. Wow. Interesting. This is the same one. They grew up in Mississippi, and their grandma told her blood to that bush over there, girl, get yourself a snitch, and it better be good. <laughs> she grew up to be a pretty good functioning member of society. <laughs> So now, corporal punishment is wrong, and the court of Cain's government has the backing of what they call science, and in their eyes, the Bible is outdated and antiquated. They have promoted divorce. They have promoted destruction of the family unit. They have promoted the model for their society and its degradation of godliness, and they will not stop until God makes them. Amen. Everything they do is trying to create unrest in society. They say they speak of peace. 
And what they say is speaking a different language than the word of our Lord. And the question is this. Who will we listen to? They speak of peace. They speak of what they call right. But look, you know what they do? They clump, they clump their lies under a shroud of socialism right. and unrighteous equity. And the reason I know these things is because I've had to take their classes. I had to go through all of this. See, they're trying to tell, but you don't understand. No, you're wrong, sir. You're wrong, ma'am. I do understand. I read your books. I had to to get an A in the class so that I could get my nursing degree. I took your socialism class. I took your multiple psychology classes. And I filtered it down through the word of God. And I come to the conclusion that you're found wanting. Mm. Yeah. The on. handwriting is on the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the right. prophecy of Daniel. The, you have found wanting. Mm -hmm. Your decisions about society have been found wanting in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. And you will be judged. Yes. It's coming. They give woman, man over they give woman power over man. They change the definition of marriage. They change the definition of gender. And yes, they use race to divide. Us. Come on. First time I've ever done this before. I'm about to do it, my friend. They use race to divide us even more than we are already divided. Right, right. And they continue to tell us in society that the racial issues are even worse. Now, I'm going to be the first one to sit here and tell you I have never walked in dark colored skin. I'm a white boy. I don't have, and listen, some of y'all right now, you might already be getting stirred up, and you still got some prejudice stuff up in your heart. And you got it, and listen, it's safe, because guess what? You got it probably from your dad. Just like I got it from my dad. Because there was a time that I had prejudices in my heart. I can tell you right now, I know where the Lord removed it from. And it is a spirit from the enemy. It is a spirit from the enemy. Hate that divides is a spirit from Satan. It is demonic. And I hope it's stirring some of you. I hope it is. I hope that the Lord is showing you that it's still in you. If it's in you. If it's not in you, then praise God. We've been delivered. But look, I'm going to just get started with this. They, 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 they're, they're trying to divide us even more. They speak about reparation of the past. Mm -hmm. Come on. Just in case you listen to this and your prejudice heart's already being stirred, thinking that I'm about to shake, take your side, know you're wrong. Slavery is and was satanic. Right, right. There was nothing about it that was good. Right. But to imagine that the answer to the past is to make white people pay reparations monetarily is the most ludicrous stupidity that right. I've ever heard. Right. I'm just here to tell you the truth. Right, right. I'm going to speak the truth. All right. That is the most ludicrous thing that I've ever heard. Because the greedy heart of man will not be satisfied. And if you give him a dollar, just like Daddy warned me, boy, don't give that bully a dollar on the playground. Don't let him take your lunch money, boy. No, my daddy wasn't a man of God. He, didn't. he said, you better pop him in the mouth, son, because he's taking a dollar today, but tomorrow is two. And the next week is three. You better just take your whooping now and stand up for what is right and let him know. He might have to fight every day. And that's the greed. That's the hunger. Look, the, the pit of hell is never satisfied. Yeah, and, the, and the heart that loves greed is never satisfied. Yeah. It's time somebody to stand up and say the truth. It's full of the lies of Satan. Let me make myself clear. If this government ever passes a law, you may not agree with this, and that's okay. But if this government ever passes a law that makes a white man pay taxes as reparation for slavery, guess what? I'm going to pay my tax. I'm going to pay my tax. As long as there ain't a mark of the beast connected to it, I'm going to pay my tax. Because I'm under the authority of the government. You can do what you want. You don't, if you don't want to pay your tax, you don't have to pay your tax. If you want to go to jail for that purpose, I'm not even saying it's going to happen. I'm trying to give you a, 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 a place where you can bring your mind and understand what I'm trying to say. Okay. You understand what I'm getting at? And, and if you chill, I won't pay that tax! Okay, you might go to jail. <laughs> you might find yourself in captivity. And if that's the, the mountain you want to die on, so be it. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. If you don't want to swab in your nose, don't get a swab in your nose. If you don't want a shot, don't get a shot. But there may be a time coming when, in number one, if you don't want to wear a mask, don't get a shot. Boom, we'll turn off your digital dollar. Next is 
something else waiting for you in a town close to you. I'm just trying to prepare your heart. They speak about reparation in the past. I'll pay my tax as long as there's not a mark of the beast, right? I will pay it as long as they don't make me transgress the law of my God. Amen. I will abide by the laws of the land in which I live because the word that my God gave me told me to respect the authorities that are in place. But if you think that money is going to repair the sin of slavery, you are a fool. Come on. The greedy heart of man will not quit with a tax. Earthly money will never quit a spiritual travesty. It will require blood to pay that debt. Mm -hmm. come on, come on. This problem is sin. This is not a skin color problem. That's right. This is a sin problem That's right. that comes from Satan. Yes. And reparations have already been paid. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Reparations were paid by the blood of a lamb that was born our name before the foundations of the earth. Destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. 
<coughs> even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you come into Zohar. You know, I just want to say this, and if the Lord says so, and I'll preach the next half of this message next week, it'll focus more on Abraham and Lot and Melchizedek, who we've learned about Wednesday. If you weren't here, you might want to go back and watch that message. But Abraham, I want you to understand, Abraham had been given a promise from God. You and I have been given a promise from God. That if we will search after and follow after the Lord, that we will be citizens of the celestial city. You understand what I'm saying? And there's an eternity to embrace. Abraham, he was the father of our faith. He believed God when there was no Israel. He believed God when there was no Messiah. He believed God before there was a cross. Before there was a law. He believed the Lord. He paved the way for you and I. Abraham had been given a promise from God and he made a decision that reflected God's nature, not human nature. What did he say to Lot? Look to the left. Look to the right. Whatever you want, you take that. He preferred his brother over himself. Because look, he knew whatever God's got for me, you can't take it. Because what God's got for us is something bigger than what we got on this earth. Amen. God's nature is that Christ preferred us over himself. God's nature is that we prefer our brother over ourselves. Abraham said, choose for yourself right and left and I will go the other way. Lot chose what looked the best. You understand? Lot chose what looked the best. And made most sense to him according to his human nature. His decision will be the beginning of sorrow and pain. Verses 11 and 12, we're about to close. Musicians, y'all can come forward. We want to close in a song. We want to worship the Lord. We want to give our heart to Jesus. We want to let God move in our hearts. Amen. After a message like this that's been preached, we want God's spirit to minister to our hearts. In verse 11 of Genesis 13, says, so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley, and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled amongst the cities of the valley and moved his tent. This one says towards Sodom. The one I put says, moved his tent as far as Sodom. Uh, he was a shepherd and saw that the valley was well watered and chose the Jordan Valley for himself and pitched his tent to the sun. You know, this can be taken so many ways in the life of a believer. The jobs that you choose to take, if it's not bathed in prayer, you can just be making a decision based on who's paying more. And you don't even know you might have hooked yourself up with a company that they pay for today, but they ain't never going to give you a raise tomorrow. And you can take a job, right, where they pay it less, and yet they're giving, and they see your work ethic, and now you've surpassed that other pay scale by so much, but no, you didn't take the time to get the voice of the Lord. Same thing with your mate that you marry, same thing with the house you live in, same thing over and over again with all the decisions that we make in life. And the question is, are we just going to look at what looks right to our eyes, it feels right to our heart, sounds right to our ears, or will we filter through the Word of God? Help us. Let's seek the face of God this morning. Amen. And listen, if you need prayer, I want to be able to pray with you. So you just need to know it's all for Amen.